Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to The Flame, those of you that are here in person, which is fantastic to see, and those of you who are watching from home by live stream. So here we are all together in the Belfry Theatre, located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people. I'd like to thank sincerely the Songhees and Esquimalt nations for the privilege and the honor of creating and living and storytelling here on their territory, on this land which they have cared for for so many decades and which represents their culture, their language and their identity. Thank you for being here. This is the Belfry's first public in-person event and it's overwhelming to see so many people sitting here. It's, um, yeah. It's been a year and a half and I thank all of you for, uh, for coming and I thank uh, everyone, uh, all of our patrons who have supported us both morally and financially for the past year and a half. Uh, your host this evening for The Flame co-created The Flame uh, in Vancouver over 10 years ago and we've been very fortunate uh, that she has brought The Flame here to Victoria for, over the, for the past five years. Uh, teaching workshops and coordinating and facilitating the flame events here at the Belfry. Uh, she's been a part of the Belfry for decades as an actress, a writer, a uh, director, and an artistic associate. And it's my great, great pleasure to introduce your host for this evening and a very dear friend of mine, Deborah Williams. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Michael, and thank you for letting this be um, sort of a wonderful test, all of us together and uh, experiencing some art together. Um, welcome to the flame. It's the true stories told by the people who lived them. I am so happy to be at the Belfry um, for the first time in 19 months and to be launching. It is actually the 13th um, season of The Flame, which I didn't know if I was supposed to skip and actually go from 12 to 14, but 12 was just so damn hard that I think 13 is just fine. Um, the Victoria Flame is usually held, as many of you know, in the lobby where we're crush a hundred people really close and cozy and squishy together, but that's not legal anymore. So we are safely and comfortably socially distanced this evening in the Stewart Theater. And it's so beautiful to be in a space and to fill a space that is meant to have stories told in it. So I am very grateful. Thank you all for being here tonight, for actually following through, for getting a ticket and then going, you know, it's Monday night and I don't know, after dinner, really? I didn't pay that much for it. We could just, and then you came anyway, so thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna start the evening right now um, and introduce musician, composer, singer, and all-around creator, Enrique Rivas, who is gonna be our musical guest for this evening.
Yes, oh my goodness. And if we ask very nicely, I hope he will stay and play a couple of more tunes for us this evening. That was such a wonderful way to start the evening. I don't know what it is about those chord progressions, but man, does it ever get me. All right. The flame has three simple rules. The story has to be true, it has to be about you, and told in a few, 10 minutes or less. So let's get the storytelling going. I would like to introduce our first storyteller. She is a Brazilian Canadian singer songwriter for the band Hecate's Torch, is that right? Uh, playing together with her husband. She immigrated to Canada in 2015. Uh, coming from the Amazon and is a proud jungle girl. She is a witch, she is a priestess, she is a mother of three girls, two human and one feline, and is recovering really remarkably from surgery on both legs. She was going to do this story sitting down, but she's doing well enough to actually do this story standing up. Let us welcome Kenny Hackett. Good evening, everyone. You're so beautiful today, even wearing masks. <laughs> All right. I guess I need my glasses. Thank you. What I'm going to tell you took me years to talk about. The experience resulted in big trauma that affected my self-esteem. And this is the first time I'm going to talk about it. I am a singer, an actress. I am in a choir, my school choir. I am five years old in rehearsal for a play. And this is my first role at a Christmas play, the Nativity, the birth of Jesus. And I am playing Mary, his mother. My parents are and I am super excited about my performance. Some rehearsals are practicing how to walk properly at the right speed, finding our marks on stage so we can perform the nativity scene. All of the actors are students at the same Lyrici school administered by a Russian Brazilian teacher and called Escolinha Petrovsky in Manaus, Amazon, Brazil, because I'm a jungle girl. So my performance will start being spotlighted at the center of the red carpeted hallway behind the last row of audience seats with the baby Jesus in my arms. And I walk majestically down the red carpet towards the stage where I will take my place beside Joseph, the three Magi and the animals at the stable. Three kids dressed up as a donkey, a cow and a sheep. The place today, so I wake up early with excitement. My heart is beating fast, my hands are sweaty, and I cannot focus on anything else. In the car, I'm walking the glorious steps of my magnificent entrance on the screen of my mind. I am carrying baby Jesus. I am his mother. It is my first role, and I am a goddess. I am important. I can see myself moving through the huge audience, all eyes on important me, long blonde hair, a beautiful classical Christmas carol playing, adding pomp and circumstance to the magical scene. We arrive, and I am strangely nervous. My stomach feels so funny, with so many butterflies. My heart is beating even faster, and my legs are shaking. I am actually anxious when I was so excited before. Oh, wait a minute. I am still excited. <coughs> am I more excited than nervous or more nervous than excited? I have no idea. But even with this doubt in my mind, I am determined. I say bye to mom and dad who head to the audience while I go to my place. A small royal blue chair hidden behind a dark blue curtain near the main red carpet hallway. I wait. I am so focused and concentrated on my divinity. 
I do not notice all the other kids' parents and relatives, friends, teachers, special guests entering the magnificent theater. No, I do not look at all the people's jostling for seats. I will not get distracted from my divine role. I am Mary, the goddess mother of Jesus. Besides, if I get distracted, the butterflies will return to my stomach. No way, not a good idea. And the moment finally arrives. Our teacher is on the stage, proudly introducing the play and the young actors. Soon it will be my turn. Will I walk perfectly? Will I convince the audience that I am Jesus' mother? Looking back at the show, I recognize what a perfectionist I was, even then. And it's funny, when you look back at yourself at so young age and identify the same personality and behavior patterns as today. Psychology says perfectionists frequently believe they are worthless unless their accomplishments are perfect. They equate failure to lack of personal worth. That was, no, that is me. So I finally get it. I am fucking scared. I have to be perfect. The music theme for my royal entrance starts. towards the spot. When the spotlight is on me, here at the beginning of the red carpet, with baby Jesus in my arms, I walk. All eyes on me. Is it good? Oh yeah, definitely wonderful. They are all looking at me and some of them have tears in their eyes. I cannot see my parents. Are they feeling proud of me? I proceed. As I approach the stage, I am walking a bit faster than in rehearsal, but I have to keep rhythm. With baby Jesus on my right arm, I use my left hand to hold my long. This is the first time I have worn the tunic. I have not rehearsed wearing this tunic. Those few stairs will take me finally to the stage, but I have to hold my tunic with both hands because it's too long. How can I use both hands if I'm carrying baby Jesus? <laughs> and a roar of laughter. Where's my baby? Baby Jesus is rolling over the edge of the stage when I bump into the floor. Oh no, I killed baby Jesus. <laughs> Pretending that nothing happened, I grabbed my dad baby Jesus doll, body and head, and joined an activity scene. <laughs> The show must go on. And after all these years of trauma and silence about the biggest gaff of my artistic career, I finally accepted that I would rather be a comedian. <laughs> Thank you. Sammy, hey, Kat, you can have a bow. Go ahead. Go ahead, have a bow. Yeah, have a bow. Like only Brazilians do. Honestly, they 
they do, okay? They brought me something completely new. How can they be in touch with you about that? Because everyone's invited, right? We have an Instagram, yeah. Yeah? And on Facebook, too. You just look for Party Brazil Events. Party Brazil Events. Yes. Highly recommend it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you, thank you. One more round of applause. For the mother of God, yes. All right, and this is Ruth. I want you to think. Who's with us and, um, and taking care of a very important part of this evening. So I wanted her to sit with us and acknowledge that this is part of what we do. All right, our next storyteller is Sarah Rose. Um, they're a queer musician, singer-songwriter, who has recently fulfilled a seven-year dream of making Victoria their home. And they're very passionate about community, friendship, love, anti-oppression activism, creating safe places for emotional expression, and their favorite part of autumn is sweater, uh, sweater mitten weather. Uh, <laughs> if they were still in Ontario, they would also say frozen puddles. But this is their first autumn in BC. So welcome, Sarah Rose. Hello. It's so nice to be here. OK, so. I'm 19 years old. It's the summer after my second year of university. My first summer away from home, which is a small northern town whose idea of out there is uh, my pursuit of a psychology career and my passion as a songwriter. <sighs> Sweet freedom. I spent the summer working a job that doesn't matter much. I started playing percussion and singing backup vocals in an indie grass band. And I recorded my first album of original songs. I'm stepping into being the person I've always wanted to be, and I always felt I could be. I have also spent the summer going to parties and intuiting, quite accurately, which guy I'd end up kissing at the end of the night. <laughs> so here I am at, the end of summer part, at an end of summer party. I was invited by a group of acquaintances who would have been my friends if I hadn't gotten mono from my secret boyfriend in first year and missed three weeks of crucial bonding time at the start of Spanish classes. <laughs> so I really want to make a good impression. Be normal, Sarah. Be cool. Maybe, maybe you'll meet a guy, like a normal 19-year-old. So they're playing beer pong in the basement kitchen, Sophia's basement, with red solo cups. Sophia is one of my potential friends. I joined the drinking game just long enough to be able to socialize the way I like. I feel warm and buzzy and I head toward the couch in the corner when a woman about my age walks in. I decide to warm up my social skills, um, introduce myself. I sit on the back of the sofa and she sits on the armrest. There's something about her I don't recognize, a kind of confidence, a sense of self I'm not familiar with. Her name is Jamie. She's also a student. We exchange numbers. Yay, new friend, I think to myself. Jamie's wearing a black hoodie with the hood pulled up and a chunky knitted beanie, the color of my favorite coloring pencil from childhood, peacock blue. Something compels me to touch her hat. Wow, Jamie, your hat is so beautiful. Wait, am I flirting? No, no, we're new friends. Thanks, she says. And the next thing I know, we're kissing, like, Full on making out. Her lips are pressed against mine. Tongues intertwined, soft, supple, gentle. She seems really confident, sure of herself. I'm thinking, this is okay, right? I've never done this before with, with, with a woman. I mean, uh, I guess it's okay. My mom would not approve. But I like it. It's a little like flying. Then I hear it from across the room, Sophia. One of my should have been friends. I don't know, by curious? Everything stops. My heart starts racing. In an instant, I realize nothing will ever be the same. I will never be the same. I pull away from the warm, comforting, unfamiliar kiss. Um, I need the bathroom. I'll be right back. 
I look in the mirror. I'm straight. I'm straight. <laughs> I'm straight. I'm straight. I, I, I'm straight. I can't, I can't be gay. I'm into guts. I'm, I'm straight. I use the toilet. As I'm on the toilet, I hear music from the living room. I kissed a girl and I like the way. <laughs> Back to the mirror. I'm straight. I'm straight. I'm, st I'm straight. I'm, st I'm straight. But I really liked that a lot. Really? No, no, nope. I'm straight. Leave the bathroom. Jamie's waiting for me in the living room. Look, I'm sorry, Sarah. I know you're straight. Oh, thank God she said it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I am. But uh, maybe we can have like a friend coffee? Oh, uh, sure. So um, I'm gonna go to my friend's house, she says. She's not moving. She's waiting for me to say something. My words are getting caught in my throat and I blurt, no, uh, don't go, you should, you should stay. <laughs> then her face and her raised eyebrow and that smirk. Why do you want me to stay? <laughs> what I'm thinking is, I want to make out some more and for longer and, and talk about what the heck is happening right now. What I say is, it's a party, it's fun, you just stay. <laughs> My face is on fire. Again, that look on her face, her voice. Ugh. Why do you want me to stay? My stomach is tightening, my sweat is pooling everywhere. What I'm thinking is, because you, you pointed at a part of me I didn't know existed, and I, I don't know if I'm allowed, and I don't know if my friends and family will still love me, and, and I don't want to be alone with that right now. Also, I like kissing you, and I wouldn't mind doing more of that. <laughs> what I said was, because it's a party, it's fun, you should stay. She just looks at me for a second, her shoulders kind of slump, with a half sigh. I'm gonna go. So I watch her leave, dumbfounded. Uh, I'm still trying to catch up on what's happening, what's, ha what's just happened. I feel my shoulders drop. All of a sudden I realize all that matters is what I want, right? I run up the stairs and outside to call after her. It's raining, my socks are wet. All I see are broken reflections of streetlights on the soaked pavement. No, no Jamie in sight. Wow, how the bow? <laughs> Sarah Rose. Thanks, Sarah Rose, because they took this class with me this weekend because their cousin told them to, <laughs> and, and just offered such uh, wonderful insight and caring support, and then just poured their heart onto the page, and uh, it was a wonderful weekend. There were six of us that spent it together working on some stories, and I asked Sarah Rose at the last minute, would you like to come and show people what it's like to, you know, write a story? And they did. Thank you so much. Isn't it romantic? Oh my God. I love it so much. I could just hear it over and over again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and maybe we'll get you back to do a musical guest too. That would be wonderful. Welcome to Victoria. All right, our next storyteller is Salma Jamel. She is an English-Spanish bilingual interpreter and translator. She's a Mexican mom. Her background is in advertising production, sales and marketing, public relations and professional photography, art direction and graphic design, as well as the economic administrative field uh, in addition, Selma is a certified psychotherapist and is trained in psychosocial 
interventions with UNICEF. She's also a visitor and just joined in this weekend because her friend told her she should <laughs> and then said, yeah, she would tell her story tonight. So I welcome Salma Jamal. here and I'm very excited and I'm very proud of my transformation oh, wow I just met him three hours ago and we spent the night laughing and dancing and party at a friend's house that at that party that they prepared for us and they were right when they introduced us we are getting along. Um, we end up to see the, seeing the sunrise overlooking the Gulf of California, very romantic sunrise. He's telling me how beautiful I am and that he wants me to be the mother of his children. <laughs> He's polite and gentle. He's doing all the right things to romance me. He's so respectful. And I think he just wants to get into my pants. I'm glad I brought my chaperone with me. <laughs> it's been a week now. And we have been going with my friends to the beach, party after party, having a lot of fun. And this is almost like a honeymoon by now. Oh my goodness. He's so splendid. He comes to visit me and meet my family in my hometown. I don't want to have a boyfriend. I just like him having so much fun. And all these guys are trying to conquer my heart. I would rather keep having fun without any commitment. It feels good to have all the attention. I'm being treated like a goddess. I'm only 23. I'm the cat's meow. <laughs> He's such a gentleman. He likes my Mexican old school education and respect the fact that I don't want to have sex yet. He follows all my requests by the book and fulfills the protocols of asking my hand before my family. Uh, if I'm not in love by now, with, uh, sh with time, I surely will. Who wouldn't fall in love with such devotion and true love shown? I couldn't resist. resist. I accept to marry him. It's been eight months. We're getting married. He's doing all the right things for me. He insists to spend the first week of our honeymoon at my mom's so we could spend some more time with my family before we move into another city. He listens to me. He covers with me with presents. I'm his queen. I'm protected. Oh, God, he's madly in love with me. Just thinking about me makes me want to get married again. Surprise after surprise. Now he says he just wants to make sure that it's true that I'm a virgin. Otherwise, he's leaving, he, he's leaving me behind at my mom's. Uh-oh. Now he's honest. <laughs> he's telling me that the real reason we're staying at my mom's is that. For him, I'm only worth it because I'm a virgin. I'm kind of glad it was painful and I bled because I passed his test. I'm worthy of him. I'm clean. I'm glad I waited to share my body with someone who values that so much. He's madly in love with me. I'm the person he loves the most. He leaves his country and this life behind to live with me or dream life by the beach. And yes, I mean it. We go to the beach like five times a week, snorkeling, camping, fishing. So much fun. I'm really enjoying this. We're still like in a honeymoon. I don't want to have children yet, though. I want to keep having fun. And oh, boy, this is fun. He starts on beer pretty early in the day. Every day, it's a party with him. Oh but the red flights start to come out. The honeymoon's over. It's been a month. 
and he keeps drinking every day. Now I see how possessive he is. He controls how I dress up, how I eat, my deodorant even. He gets so mad because I made him a surprise party and that triggers something from his childhood. I end up at the police department covered in bruises. But my family and my beloved ones tell me this is how it really goes. It's autumn. We're really, it's like autumn. We're adapting to the changes. And you're adapting to each other, right? You have to stay. Oh God, I want to do the right thing. I don't want to be told I'm a quitter again. The church leader tells me, go back home because love is forgive me, forgiving and all that preaching. I just want to be a good person. It's been a nightmare. But everyone in my family, my friends, everyone I love tell me I have to stay. Only the neighbors who are the ones who hear all the yelling and they hear me crying. They see me trying to escape over the fence, but everyone keeps telling me I have to put up with it. Only I know everything that's happening here. And one of us isn't gonna make it. I don't know how he changed, and he did change a lot. Five years later, we decide to have a baby. Everyone tells me that Babies make couples bond. I don't believe that, but I wanna do what I'm told because I wanna do the right thing. I wanna be a good girl. I wanna be approved. I want to be accepted. <sighs> Finally, another episode of violence. I defend myself. We both hurt each other. I've been, it's been one month of me recovering in bed, planning my escape. I pull out my secret plan. I've been preparing for eight years. I'm grabbing my emergency money. And I start my adventurous flight with my daughter in a safe and continuous healing transformation journey in Salma's pink world, where I am still writing, where I'm accepted, I freed myself, I, I'm still a good girl, and I'm the girl I want to be. I'm doing the right thing, I'm accepted, and I approve myself. I'm alive! Thank you so much for sharing that story. and. Um, yeah, that was a really vulnerable piece, and thank you for just getting up and do that today, and it's, um, it's phenomenal. Thank you. A round of applause, please. I think we need some music. Would that be okay, Nikki? Oh, excellent. She says, what a coincidence. <laughs> Now, I must say, uh, I have to confess, uh, I was going to be silly at this moment and pretend the guitar didn't work, and then I was going to rattle it around, and, and then, oh, there's something in here, and then I was going to pull this out and oh, I'd be surprised and all that, but, you know, after the, the truthful stories, I, I don't think I could do it, you know. <laughs> no. sure. uh, but anyway, it looks nice. Huh? stomp a little bit to get you know in the groove but I'm sort of on in a on a cloud I guess
you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Jessica Navarro. Did I do it right? No, not even close, right? Okay. okay. This is my big fear, right? Pronouncing people's names wrong in front of a lot of other people. It happens. It happens. Navarro. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> She's originally from Brazil. Jessica is a lifelong learner with a political science and marketing in her educational background. She is currently 9 to 5 at the college registrar's office. Her favorite part of autumn is the color of foliage and pumpkin spice lattes. And how they remind her of everything else pumpkin that she could be eating all year round but only does in the autumn. <laughs> Jessica Navarro. Good evening. Can you hear me well? Hi. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> Thank you. They told me to test this earlier, but I thought, yeah, let's check. Um, okay. It's December 2012. I'm 20 years old and I'm living in France. I'm from Brazil, but since September, I've been here as an exchange program student at l'Université Paris-Nanterre. It's been a very nice experience so far, but right now I'm really looking forward to my parents' visit this month. I miss them so much, and I can't wait to enjoy every minute of us being together, especially here on the old continent. Well, they've traveled to Europe four years ago, but back then I was out in the world for the first time by myself. I was in Winnipeg, Canada. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I survived the cold in winter bag. Negative temperatures actually let me have a wonderful experience as a high school exchange program student. Winnipeggers are so proud of their winters, and I learned to have fun in the snow. I guess that's when my travel bug really started, or at least that's when it went up to a whole other level. I had traveled by myself to another country, and it felt great. How independent that 16-year-old me was feeling. But anyway, I digress. Here I am, looking out the window from this small studio apartment at the Résidence Saint-Cloud in the western suburbs of Paris. The sky is gray and cloudy, and there's this one tree by the beige wall that surrounds the residence area, which pretty much sums up the view I have from this side of the building. Now that the winter is almost here, most of the leaves are gone, so it's basically a naked tree by a beige wall under a pale sky. <laughs> Good thing is that my mind is now focused on the travel plans to meet my parents. Reservations are confirmed, and I just send them a quick email with a heads up about our arrivals in Rome, which is our first destination together. The bed and breakfast that we booked is at walking distance um, to the station where they're going to arrive by train. I'm going by, by plane, but we agreed to meet at this station. My parents arrive in Rome and are on their way to the bed and breakfast. After a few minutes of walking around on the street that the address indicated, there's no sign of the place and they clearly look lost. A nice Italian guy approaches their confused selves and in English slash slowly spoken Italian, <laughs> shares the news that the accommodation no longer operates there. The good news though, is that the owner of that restaurant just around the corner also owns a bed and breakfast and the guy could introduce them. Ristorante Alfredo. Yes, that's right. The owner shared the same first name as my dad and that could only mean a good start. Conversation goes well, um, it follows with lots of gestures, smiles, uh, but just a few sentences. They eat lunch and then they go check one of the rooms available at Alfredo's Bed and Breakfast. There is a double bed and a single bed with a private washroom. It works perfectly for us. I finally arrive at the Aeroporto Internazionale di Roma Fiumicino Leonardo da Vinci. 
I'm filled with excitement. I'm in the same city as my parents, and soon we will reunite. I leave the terminal with my backpack, and I make my way to the exit where I can take the bus to the station. I know the bus departs every half hour, which means I still have a few minutes to the next one, and I'm really hungry. So I decide to stop at this coffee shop just by the exit. I don't speak any Italian, and as I start to approach the counter, I realize that my recently polished French skills are likely not any help right now. <laughs> I quickly scan the food displayed, and I notice it includes a few tags. The clerk greets me, and I manage to say, Ciao! Un panino prosciutto per favore! A real act of improvisation, sponsored by years of watching Brazilian telenovelas starring <laughs> Italian families. <laughs> I eat my ham sandwich on the bus on the way from the airport to the station. It turns out there's a lot of ham and it's extremely salty, but that doesn't bother me as much because I'm enjoying a spectacular drive. As the bus enters the city, I feel like I'm visiting pages of a history book. Rome is so beautiful. The pillars, the ruins, an open-air museum. It's sunny, the sky is blue, and the tall, umbrella-shaped pine trees are all around with that pretty olive green that so perfectly tells me I'm in Italy. After about an hour, I get off the bus at Roma Termini, the rail station. My state of pure joy from such a beautiful trip then starts to fade, just as quickly as the bus moved away and apparently everyone else who got off the bus with me found their pass. There's a buzz of people rushing through and passing by in every direction, and I see signs that point to way too many platforms, not only for trains, for a subway as well. This station is huge, and I don't know how I'm going to find my parents here. First of all, how naive were we? It's not like we had never been to large stations before, but in the midst of all our excitement, we agreed that my estimated time of arrival, purely based on my flight time and bus schedule, would suffice for us to meet there. It turns out, however, that Roma Termini is one of the largest rail stations in Europe. <laughs> I wait by the bus stop for a few long minutes, and as I take in the surroundings, the history book scenario from my bus trip was abruptly taken over. Ancient Rome, fast forward to 2012, where everybody seems to be in a hurry. There's no sign of my parents. Still, I hesitate to leave that area because of the bus signs, but who knows how many bus stops there are at this station. I walk around for a little bit, trying to at least keep in mind the direction of the entrance I arrived. My hands are and feet are cold and sweaty, and I feel the pressure to make the decision to, you know, give up on our meeting plan and head straight to the bed and breakfast. I have the address anyway. I printed the email confirmation that my dad forwarded to me a few days ago. I, yeah, that's right. That sounds reasonable as I think about it. At some point, my parents will think about going back there to chat. Canada, friends. I can guarantee that right now, my mom is not taking any of those experiences I had into consideration. I'm her only child, and in a situation like this, I'm sure she can't help but worry about me. I can even bet <laughs> that she has made her prayers to São Longuinho. The tale I have always heard in Brazil is that Saint Longuinho is the saint that helps us find what or who we're looking for. The prayer goes like this. Saint Longuinho, Saint Longuinho, if I can find Jessica, I'll give you three little jumps. <laughs> I mean, I'm not even sure that promising little jumps qualifies as an actual prayer, or if Son Longuinho has a more formal name himself, but he sounds like a pretty cool saint, and I would even risk to say he's the most popular saint in Brazil, or at least that prayer is. Despite all the little jumps that my mom is certainly already owing by now, she and my dad agree that the best plan at the moment is for my dad who's got the best sense of direction, to walk around looking for me while she stays right there where they are, in the center of the main atrium, atrium, connected to hallways coming in from different directions. 
I am by myself and I have had enough of walking in circles or standing still. I need to search for an information desk where I can grab a map that will make me able to make my way to the, to, to the bed and breakfast. As I'm walking with the confidence of someone who finally got a plan, I hear one of the most familiar voices I know. Bia! It's my mom. She's, she yells a quaint childhood, a quaint childhood nickname. From her strategic location, she saw me coming into the atrium, and then we hug each other, it's pure joy, and mom is already paying her prayers <laughs> to Sao with quick little jumps. As she looks at me and says, now we both wait here because I have no idea where your father is. Jessica <laughs> 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 Navarro, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, that's so fun. You did such a great job, thank you. I just, um, I don't know if you know how many um, Brazilian people live in Victoria, <laughs> but I found out it's like it's a hotbed, right, of Brazilian parties and people. So, um, yeah, we should put up a poster or something. <laughs> was um, lucky enough to work with um, a group of Portuguese-speaking storytellers during uh, the spring over Zoom. And it was originally going to be just um, Brazilian storytellers and then all sorts of other people who spoke Portuguese around the world joined in too. And it was, it was such a marvelous and three storytellers here. So Femi, Jessica, and Daniela are here from that group. It was a wonderful way to spend the spring. Thank you. All right, our next storyteller, Dave. I know, look at you. <laughs> you snuck in last, so you didn't even know where you're going to be, right? Dave Morris. <laughs> he's a poet, magician, teacher, storyteller, and mostly he's an improviser. He is the artistic director of the award-winning Paper Street Theatre Company in Victoria, and chances are he likes you. <laughs> and I like him, Dave Morris. <laughs> So nice to be here. Hi, everybody. I haven't stopped smiling since I came in, even during the sad stories. I'm just like, it's so nice to be in a room with people. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. And everyone at home. Hi. The camera adds 10 pounds. Everybody here, the pandemic adds 20. Um, just for the record. Uh, but so nice to be here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell a story. This is great. Uh, my story is uh, about this amazing thing that I find amazing. That if you hear a word that has the, the right intonations to it, an entire song will come to mind, right? Here, I'll give you an example. Yesterday. You can't, it comes right to your mind, right? Uh, what I find even more amazing is that a song can bring an entire memory rushing back to mind. Uh, like when I hear the song Yesterday, I am sitting in a beat up Camry next to my dad whose eyes are twinkling and we're driving through the Rocky Mountains and the sun is sort of low in the sky out the passenger window. I'm right back there. My dad passed away a few years ago uh, from cancer and there's two things that bring his memory rushing back to me. The first is the changing of season from summer to autumn when the warm weather starts to get a little crisp and cool and you start to smell fall in the air. Incidentally, what's happening outside right now. And the other is the song Yesterday. One of those happens every single year, and I can emotionally prepare myself for the, emo the, the memory. Others, the other one happens out of nowhere. Like I just walk into a grocery store and suddenly I'm thinking about my dad. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's weird because music and especially the Beatles and that song had never had anything to do with my dad and I's relationship. My whole life. That had nothing to do with it. We weren't like musical as a family. Like we sing and stuff. My dad, the most we ever got was karaoke, right? <laughs> Where it was the 90s and we had those VHS tapes that you could put in and the little things. And my dad would get up and sing like, cheer up, sleepy G. Right? And he, but, he, but when he would, he would light up and it was a lot of fun. That's as close as music ever came between me and my dad. 
Uh, the real thing that connects me and my dad is storytelling. Uh, surprise, surprise. My dad loved telling stories. Uh, and he would always tell stories about Whistler, the old days of Whistler, before it was a tourist trap, back when it was like a ski bomb village. Uh, and he would tell stories about like old Bobby, who decided to rob the bank one day, the bank that would get driven up from Squamish once a week. And old Bobby tried to rob it. And he was stupid, because everyone knew he was going to do it. <laughs> and there's only one road out of town. <laughs> stupid Bobby. And that would be the story. Not a good story. I never said he was good. I never said he was a good storyteller, but he liked telling stories. And they always ended like that. He'd shake his head and he'd laugh about somebody or something, or one of the many characters from Whistler. Uh, and actually, incidentally, I don't know what happened to Bobby. I don't know if he got arrested or if he got away with it. I've never asked. Um, and of course, now I can't. So I'll never know what happened to Bobby. And the real truth is, even before my dad passed away, I couldn't have asked. Because uh, as the cancer started to sort of spread through his body, his mind started to go. And Alzheimer's started to come in, which runs in his family. And so he started forgetting everything. And, uh, and like cancer is what killed my dad but Alzheimer's what took his life from him. If you could imagine a storyteller not being able to tell their own stories. Uh, and so when it started getting that bad, something had to be done about my dad. So uh, I couldn't take him in. I was living in a basement with a brand new baby. Uh, my sister was living in an even smaller place all by herself. So someone had to take in my dad. And thankfully, Uncle Mitty stepped in, who's not actually my uncle, by the way. He's just a character from one of my dad's stories from Whistler. <laughs> Uh, so, so he stepped in and said he'd take him, but it meant that someone had to get my dad from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Roslyn, which is in the middle of the mountains, uh, another ski bum village, of course. Uh, so I had to get my dad from Vancouver to Roslyn, and being the more responsible son, not the oldest, but the more responsible son, <laughs> I got the job. And so my dad and I drove through the Rockies together which is a beautiful drive. I've done it many times, and every time I do it, it's the most beautiful thing I ever get to experience. If you haven't done it, you should do it. Uh, the most difficult thing I've ever had to experience is driving for 12 hours through the mountains with my dad, who has Alzheimer's. Uh, I became a Zen master of answering the same question. <laughs> my dad must have thought I would like it because he would ask one question and I would answer the next four because I knew I was coming. <laughs> Right. Uh, I started responding to whatever name was the one he thought I was. Am I my uncle? Am I me? It doesn't matter. I'll just respond. Uh, and, uh, and then when it would get bad, and I could see his chewing on his teeth and looking out the window like he's forgetting who he is, I would just ask him to tell me a story, or one that I knew he still knew. I'd be like, hey, Dad, tell me about that time you met Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, and for you youngins, uh, Trudeau Sr. Justin's dad. Uh, tell me about the time you met Prime Minister Trudeau. And he would come alive in that moment. And he'd go, oh, yeah, well, you know, I was working up on Whistler Mountain. I was Alpine supervisor back then. Got to spend all day on skis. Best days of my life. And we wrote, word got around the radio that Prime Minister Trudeau was on the mountain. So I ski down to the chairlift and I tell the young kid working it, why don't you go take a couple runs? He was always doing stuff like that. Everyone liked him. Why don't you go take a couple of runs? And so he stood there, man in the chairlift, until here he comes, the prime minister. And when he got close, I put on my hand and I said, nice to meet you, Mr. Prime Minister. <laughs> That's a story, right? It's not, it's not good. It's not a, there's no arc. There's no ending. But that's the story that he loves to tell. And so every once in a while, I would just ask him, and then he would just tell it. But of course, after eight hours of this, you know, we've listened to the radio. We've, I've heard the story so many times that now we're just driving in silence. And I don't know why. I don't know what brought it out of me. It might have just been on the radio earlier. Maybe it was at the gas station when we last topped up. But for some reason, maybe it was the poetry of the moment, right? But for some reason, I just start to sing yesterday. And just like you did earlier, my dad, without missing a beat, starts singing, all my troubles seem so far away. And then together we sing, now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. 
And normally I stop there because I don't really know the song very well. Right? <laughs> but my dad keeps going. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. And he keeps going. And soon I'm singing along with him. And he leads me through the entire song of yesterday. And his eyes light up, and he's glowing, and the whole car is lighting up, and the sun is just perfectly in the sky as we sing this song together. Uh, and it's like the last moment I got to see my dad fully alive and himself. And he couldn't remember my name. He didn't know where we were going or why we were going there. And yet he could remember every word of an old song. Like he couldn't forget it. And now I can't forget. Because I believe in yes. <laughs> you. Dave Morris. I know. Now it's I know you too. Thank you. That was so beautiful. What a what a beautiful story. Thank you, Dave Morris. Thanks for being here. Thanks for. Hey, just continuing being an artist hey, during the last... Hey, congratulations, you just got a grant. I did. Yeah, and you're writing a show. I am, yeah. And when are we going to be able to see it? I'm at the Uno Fest in the new year at the Intrepid Theater. Intrepid Theater, Uno... Asterix, like if the world... If the world is still here, Dave will be at the Uno Festival. That's great advertising. Dave Morris. All right, our final storyteller for this evening is Daniela Pinto. She is a Brazilian community builder. Uh, she's been living in Victoria for over eight years. Uh, since she moved from Brasilia with her two sons, community has meant more. Recently, she's been discovering the world of storytelling, not only through stories, but through science, movement, sounds, and in circles with other women. Daniela Pinto. Oh. Yeah, of course, I'm nervous. And being after Dave, it's a challenge, but here you go. <laughs> okay. I'm working on my final assignments, and a big one is due today. Of course, I woke up feeling anxious stomach feeling empty even after breakfast. I have a morning ritual. Call meditation music playing every day at 7 a.m., soft sounds of nature, water dropping, birds singing in the back, and <laughs> <laughs> My arm just, just stretches out of the comforter and I press snooze. Yes, guilty. I do pre-plan the time we wake up with a snooze buffer. It's part of my morning ritual. Cuddles in bed is what keeps me, my heart warm and my mind in balance. I semi-open, she doesn't resist and comes crawling from somewhere under the blanket. And <laughs> our first morning kiss and then cuddles. Every day for exact 987 mornings, not that anyone is counting. We are inseparable. She's in bed with me even when I'm working on my assignments. But as her babysitter, this is our little secret. Her mom could never, um, her mom would never approve we sleep together. But deliver my assignment today is Mita's last mission. For a therapy dog is a Paw Patrol mission to the rescue. <laughs> and the days also feel strange, drizzling. Not that it's rare here, but even the day was grayer, definitely colder than yesterday. Oh, João, pega o casaco vermelho da Mita em cima. And my team just throws her red uh, raincoat down the stairs. I think Mita looks just gorgeous with her little red hoodie with a Dalmatian fur. And seems she loves to, because keeps her ear warm, I think, at least, I think. For me, my fluffy rubber boots do the trick. 
and gloves and took and a huge jacket <laughs> and every other layer that I can put on because my Brazilian DNA is constantly cold in Canada. <laughs> but Mita, she was walking through the campus half naked, like a Victoria's Secret model, chest up, <laughs> proud like a student that just defended her PhD, walking down her graduation stage with her red long gown. I actually enjoy seeing people smiling at her when we go for daily walks. It makes me smile too and warms my heart. I think everybody wins. But today, everyone who passes by us open big smiles for proud Dr. Red Hood Mita et al. 2019 period. One day, I heard my guru saying, dog is capable of love. He said something like, when human beings fail, get yourself a dog. Every day you come home, what a welcome you get, huh? Your kids? They are not good. <laughs> one day they love you, one day they hate you. But your dog, what a wonderful welcome. I think he's absolutely right. My Paw Patrol mission accomplished and more dog love spread around campus on the way back home. Time passing, stomach feeling even more empty after the walk. Hands, feet, and armpits starting to get cold and sweat as the Ritalin starts to kick in in preparation for another day of study. Another assignment, what a week. At 10 a.m., Mita runs down the stairs, barking as loud as she was a pig. <laughs> then she gets over the moon excited and starts crying and carving at the door, trying desperately <laughs> and to open. And, and she could sense through the door who was behind. She was inhaling so deeply and, and then she was losing her breath and sucking the air so strong that her eyes was almost popping out because this is absolutely part of a pug's life. And snores too, all the time. I literally have never fed alone for those 987 days and nights. I think I got used to the snores as it was a um, I like background sound that always fulfills my, my heart with that unconditional guru dog love. I opened the door. Mita just ran to her mom, 987 days without each other. It was pure joy between those two. But that day, three years of babysitting Princess Pug Mita has come to an end. Dr. Mita graduated. You know Pavlov? My boyfriend snores too, and we still use this news buffer time for morning cuddles. So it seems that for my therapy from now on, I need the snores, not the dog. <laughs> Daniela Pinto! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, I want to thank Daniela, who has really lit another flame in Victoria. Um, she's finding ways to include more people, and especially the Brazilian and Portuguese-speaking communities. And I want to thank you so much for, for taking me on this journey with you. Daniela, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's our show, everyone. What a great night. You had fun? Yeah? I want to thank Keith and Mike and Michael and Ivan and Val and Jane and Ian and Mark and everyone else who makes uh, the Bell Free Hum. And I want to especially thank uh, Matilda uh, Cervantes. Where are you? Thank you so much. Um, She's my new partner in the plane here at the Belfry, and you just jumped in with so much support and knowledge and, and enthusiasm. I just can't wait for, for February. Yeah, February 7th is the next one, but thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Fiona and Here Magazine, and I want to thank Tima and Victoria Public uh, Library and for partnering with the Belfry and me over the past year so that this creative fire can continue in Victoria uh, through more communities in more languages and abilities and ages 
and all things that keep us together and apart here in your beautiful city. And I especially want to thank our brave storytellers tonight. Give me a stand up, you guys. Jenny, Sarah Rose, Salma, Jessica, Dave, and Daniela. And our very special musical guest, Enrique, who is going to play us out. Please tell each other your stories, and we'll see you in February. Next time, I'm going to bring a sauce. <laughs> Getting all the way up here. It's been a while since you've been around. It's so nice to get together, see you face to face. Oh, oh, oh. I'm looking forward to the next one to be together. See you in 3D. It's been so long with a handful. And soon in Skype. It's so nice to get together face to face See you smile again Looking forward to the next one Be together And see you in 3D Tonight It's been so fine It's great This time we share Let's do it again real soon And tell me Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.